Well, now, if you like to turn to uh, our Bible passage for today, we're continuing our series on John's Gospel. And uh, today we come specifically to verses 19 through to 34, but we're going to read from verse 14 on page 1063. And I've asked Rebecca if she will read to us from the Scriptures. It's John chapter 1, starting at verse 14. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace, we have received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Now this was John's testimony when the Jews of of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Christ. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah, the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the desert, make straight the way for the Lord. Now some Pharisees who'd been, sent, who'd been sent questioned him, why then do you baptize if you're not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany, on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remained on him. I would not have known him except that the one who had sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. If it's uh, convenient to have page 1063 open, you may find it helpful to follow the passage for today, John 1, 19 through to 34. I don't know how many of you, uh, for better or for worse, saw the new adaption of Agatha Christie's ABC Murders on television this past week uh, featuring John uh, Malkovich and Rupert Glint. More than once, the inspector asked this question of Poirot, who are you? Who is this mysterious Belgian policeman snooping around in the interwar period London? It was a good question and one which provided an intriguing answer. It's also a question asked here in our scripture reading for today, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent their representatives down to the river Jordan by the Dead Sea in order to find out from this man called John, who as we see from verse 6 came as a witness, as a testifier concerning the word made flesh, to ask John, chapter 1 verse 21, if you yourself are not the Christ, then who are you? I think we have to understand the context of the time. At this period of history, there was high expectation among the Jewish people of revolution. 
The Roman yoke was heavy upon their shoulders, and many hoped that the one prophesied in their Scriptures, our Old Testament, would soon arise. John, are you the Messiah? Or ought we look for another? No, he said, I'm not the Christ. Then who are you? If you are not the one who will come to liberate us from the oppressors, then who is? Are you Elijah, the one who did not die but was taken up into heaven in a chariot? I am not, he replied, verse 21. Are you the prophet? That is the one mentioned in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy chapter 18 as the one who must be listened to. No. On Christmas morning, we had a visit from the fire brigade, and those of you who were here will know that I had a conversation with a fireman of very few words. And it was a bit like that here. John's conversation with the Jewish leaders from Jerusalem likewise got increasingly curt from five words in verse 20 to three in verse 21 to a simple no in the later part of 21. And the reason for this, of course, and this is our first point, first point of two this morning, is that John hadn't come to draw attention to himself. He had come as a witness, verse 7. He had come in order to testify about the light. He himself, verse 8, was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. And so when people came and pointed the television cameras at him, he wasn't at all comfortable. When the spotlight was switched on and the full glare was focused on him, he didn't do a Michael McIntyre and bask in the glory of being center stage. No, he said, switch off the spotlight, point it elsewhere. I'm not the one you're looking for, because John hadn't come to draw attention to himself. Do you remember we said in the past that John the Apostle's purpose of writing the gospel we know from chapter 20, verse 31, John the Apostle, his purpose was to write this gospel so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in His name. John the Apostle was clear as to what was his role, and in a similar way, that was also John the Baptist's purpose. As in any court of law, his responsibility was not to talk about himself, but to talk about what he had seen, what he had heard, what he had experienced. In other words, he had come to testify, to witness concerning what he knew about something else, someone else, another not himself. We live in a world of celebrity where a lot of people like to talk about themselves, where the conversation at dinner table is dominated by one forceful and colorful prima donna. Well, that was not John's way. He hadn't come to draw attention to himself because that was not his purpose. He was merely, verse 23, a voice in other words, he was there in order to be heard, but not seen. A voice crying in the wilderness makes straight the way of the Lord. In those days when the king rode his chariot in the desert, and there were few good roads, a smooth ride was very difficult for the king, so a forerunner went on ahead of the VIP party and swept aside the road of the stones and the rocks that could prove a problem for the horse's hooves and the chariot wheels. That was John's role. A person who had a significant function, but himself was not seen. In fact, read on further, and we can see that John had three specific roles. We've already said he was a voiceover, verse 23. He was a baptizer with water, verse 26. 
and he was more lowly than a slave. Verse 27, he says, the thongs of his sandals I'm not worthy to untie. So, in all these three roles, John was saying, don't look at me. John hadn't come in order to draw attention to himself. Voices are anonymous. Baptizers with water are numerous. Sandal thong untires are nobodies. They are the lowliest of the lowly slaves. But wait until you see the one I've been talking about. Wait until you encounter the one who baptizes, not merely with water, but with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Wait till you see the King of kings, the Lord of lords, whom I serve. And that will be worth talking about. Oh, for more Christians like John. It's not all about me. It's all about him. Don't look at me. Let me point you to Jesus. I'm not here in order to draw attention to myself. Who are you? My sole purpose, my chief aim in life is to point people beyond me to the source of my life, the light of the world, the one who surpasses me, verse 15, because actually he was before me. My purpose in life is to point people to Jesus who is the Christ, the Son of God. And if that was so with John, it is also the best possible thing that anybody here could ever do for anybody else. Sometimes Christian people like others can get distracted. Sometimes Christian people like everybody else can get tricked into supposing that those who talk the most about themselves or who draw much attention to themselves are the most happy or fulfilled or self-assured people we're tempted to envy and want to be like them. Whereas in actual fact, those within whom God's Holy Spirit dwell are given discernment to see past the superficial and see the true heart of people, to be sensitive where there is a yearning for acceptance, a pining for true love, a desire for forgiveness, the need of a Savior. John hadn't come in order to draw attention to himself. And that leads us seamlessly into point number two, because John had come in order to draw attention to the Lamb. Now, that's interesting back to Agatha Christie. I wonder if any of you Agatha Christie fans have noticed that in virtually every BBC production of one of her murder mysteries, there is a portrait or a picture of a lamb on one of the walls. In ABC Murders, there was one in the stairwell of Sir Carmichael Clark's house. It is an image which represents an innocent sufferer who would die next. And that's the stark impact of John 1, 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, look, the Lamb of God, the, the word actually is the sacrificial Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when, in verse 15, I first mentioned a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Now, John has already introduced us to this word who was in the beginning with God, who was God. The word who was in the world, verse 10, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. John has already introduced us to this cosmic Christ who cared for the world. But now John tells us three things about this Messiah who is full of grace and truth. We, we've learned three things 
about John the Baptist, that he was a voice, that he was a baptizer of water, and that he was a lowly slave of his master. And now we learn three things about the one he pointed to, the Christ, and they are equally as intriguing. God's Messiah, God's sent one, is a lamb, verse 29. He is a spirit-filled man, verse 33. And he is a spirit-filled sacrificial lamb who in turn baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Shall we trace these ideas through the text? Well, we've seen earlier that the Jewish leaders have already come asking nervously about the baptizer to find out if he is likely to be the Messiah who will liberate Israel. No, I'm not, said John. But let me introduce you to someone else who is worth meeting. And the first thing I've got to tell you about him is that he is a lamb, God's lamb who has come as a sacrifice, the innocent for the guilty. And this was certainly not what the Jewish leaders might have anticipated of a Jewish Messiah. And yet the concept of a sacrificial lamb was not unfamiliar to them. In Exodus chapter 12, the Israelites were after all instructed to kill a lamb, paint the blood over the doorposts so that the angel of death would pass over them. And in Isaiah 53, the prophet Isaiah described a suffering servant who would be like a lamb sent to the slaughter. Jesus is God's way for removing the sin of the world. This is not universalism. This is Jesus' sacrificial death as being adequate enough to save all of humankind. John the Baptist had come to draw attention to the Christ who would be a lamb. And this sacrificial lamb would also be one upon whom the Spirit came down and remained on him, verse 33. In the Old Testament, there were three categories of people who would be anointed. Prophets, priests, and kings but they were anointed for a specific period and for a particular reason. The Spirit could come and the Spirit could go once that job or that task or that role was over. It was past or gone. Not so Jesus. When the Spirit descended upon Jesus, He remained. He rested. He completely enveloped Jesus Christ and never departed. When you imagine someone who is filled or baptized with the Holy Spirit, I wonder what comes to mind. Somebody who's odd, eccentric, unpredictable? Well, here's the answer. Jesus. Jesus is the supremely Spirit-filled man. If you want to know what one baptized with the Spirit looks like, search no further. Here he is, supremely normal, the way a human being was always designed to be, full of grace and truth, verse 14. And since you can only give what you've got, this supremely Spirit-filled man, this sacrificial lamb, is himself the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. It's interesting, isn't it, that we think of John as the baptizer, John the Baptist. But John himself says, no, don't call me the baptizer. I only baptize with water. Any Tom, Dick, or Harry can do that. Even that clergyman Frank Seller can baptize with water. No, don't think of me as the Baptist. Think of Jesus. Jesus the Baptist. He is the baptizer of the Holy Spirit, verse 33. And I have seen and I testify that He is the Son of God. 
a wee bit later, and we'll have to wait until the 13th and the 27th of this month. John the Apostle explains more what it means to be filled with or to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And Nicodemus in chapter 3 and the Samaritan woman in chapter 4 are visual aids of what that will look like. But suffice to say here, because of Christ, the Spirit-filled sacrificial Lamb of God, it is possible for both men and women to be regenerated, changed, and renewed. And because of the Lord Jesus Christ, the supremely Spirit-filled person, it is possible for religious people and for irreligious people alike to enter into the kingdom of God not through anything they have done, but because of everything that Jesus has done on the cross. And so, this is John's testimony. This is John the Baptist's word to us today. Don't look at me. Look at the Lamb. Don't look at, the inno- don't look at me. Look at the innocent sufferer. Don't look at me. Look at the one who would die so that you might live. And so, how does chapter 1 conclude? Well, in verse 35, we see the next day, that is the next day in this new beginning that John has introduced us to, this newly created order. John the baptizer was there again with two of his disciples. And when John saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. And when the two disciples of John heard their master say this, they followed Jesus. One of those two men was Andrew, who in verse 40, we are told, was Simon Peter's brother. And the first thing that Andrew did was find Simon and tell him, we have found Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought his brother to Jesus. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, John the Baptist is named in their majesty's New Year honors list. He's right up there higher than Sir Alistair Cook. John the Baptist is described by none other than the King of Kings as the greatest man who ever existed. Why? Because instead of holding on to his own disciples, he suggested they transfer to the Lamb of God. And having pointed them to the sacrificial Savior, they in turn brought others to the Lord Jesus. And that, my friends, this morning, I suggest is still the highest calling of us in all the earth. This is the greatest thing that any one of us might ever be privileged enough to do. This is the most significant job any of us will have in 2019. To point people to Jesus, the Lamb of God, the supremely Spirit-filled person who is uniquely and supremely, totally able to take away anybody's sin. Gracious Lord, thank you for John the Baptist. And thank you even more for the one John points to us, the Lord Jesus Christ. Enable us to focus our attention on him. And in doing so, commend others to him also. And what we ask is for his glory. Amen.
Let us pray. Father in heaven, during this time of year, we're celebrating the word, your eternal son, becoming flesh and dwelling among us. And Father, we praise you that John saw the eternal glory of Jesus, and he pointed people to it. And we praise you that what he saw was not somebody who came to seek his own interests, but the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And may your kingdom come. Our Father, at the close of this year and at the start of a new one, we want to pray for our own witness to Christ. We pray that as individuals and as families in this congregation, we would be dedicated to being people who point other people to the Lamb of God. Lord, help us to order our lives, our homes, our finances, our friendships, so that we can carry out that highest calling this year. Please give us loving hearts, listening ears, words of grace seasoned with truth, so that we can make the most of every opportunity you send us. And we pray too for our witness together as a church. We pray especially for all our organizations and for our committee and our Kirk session that you might make us ready in season and out building project or no building project, whether in opposition or in friendship, to make the saving rule of Christ, our King, known to everyone around us this year. And our Father, as we pray for your kingdom to come, we want to pray for Union Theological College, which trains ministers, deaconesses, and others for gospel ministry in our church, and teaches theology to undergraduate students at Queen's University. Father, we want to thank you for the witness Union has had over many years teaching academic theology from a warm and generous Christian standpoint. And with the relationship with Queen's now under severe strain, we want to pray that that witness would be able to continue despite the stresses and the strains. We want to commit that situation into your hands, Lord, and we pray that whatever the long-term future of the relationship with Queen's, We pray that you would continue to use the college to train up workers for the harvest field. Please protect faculty members and staff during this challenging time and help them to keep serving you. And Father, as we look forward to this new year, we pray for your will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven. We pray for improvements in the situations of refugees who are risking life and limb to come to these islands. Uh, We particularly pray for for the uh, effort of our own um, government as we try to help people who are crossing the English Channel during this uh, winter season. And we pray for relief for those suffering from the earthquake and the tsunami in Indonesia. We pray for wisdom for our parliament as it returns for further debates over the future uh, relationship of this country to the European Union. We pray for those uh, with uh, special needs and social needs here in Belfast and ask that they would be cared for, uh, whether by the government or by charities or by individuals. And we pray for ourselves as a congregation as we begin to read through the New Testament over the next uh, couple of months that you would use this time to imprint your will upon our hearts and help us to do it. Our Father, please give us today our daily bread. Thank you for feeding us spiritually this morning. And please give us what we need for our journey tomorrow and on into this new year. We pray especially for those in our congregation who find this time of year hard or who are going through a difficult time just now. Please give them just what they need to keep going for another day. Our Father, we ask all this, asking that you would forgive our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And that you'd lead us not into temptation, but deliver us 
from evil. Help us to not draw attention to ourselves, but to the wonderful Lamb of God. We pray these things with hunger and with hope. And so we say, in Jesus' name, Amen.